is whenever you're in this situation and you're trying to make it, you know, sort of an inference about an important independent variable in your model and you're missing the, the data to be able to, to make that inference, what you want to do is, is something called sensitivity analyses to see if uh, sort of assumptions you make about how people would have filled out the survey had they been forced to, uh, if you can make sort of every crazy possible assumption about what people would have done had they filled out their surveys and run the model under every one of those different assumptions, you get sort of a distribution of possible, you sort of, you can create bounds on the, the full possible range of inferences you can make in your model based on uh, sort of the, the full range of possible assumptions you can make about what people would have done. So for example, we could, what we do is we, we can set everybody's ideal point to be extremely liberal, you know, so that would be saying the liberals in the room decided they didn't want to fill out their, their pretreatment survey, perhaps out of protest or something. And uh, so, so assume everybody's liberal and run the model and get a set of results. Assume everybody is extremely conservative, run the model, get the full set of results. And that helps to place balance on your treatment effect. So that's, that's doing a sensitivity analysis. And we did that. It turns out in this case, because there are so few missing data, that no matter what assumptions we use about the missing data, we get the exact same set of results. So in this case, it's almost not worth mentioning because the bounds are very precise, they're very tight around what we actually uh, find uh, but I think it's worth mentioning that doing these sensitivity analyses is important to be just thorough. Okay, so now just to quickly, I'm just going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the models and uh, our results. Uh, so the first model takes a look at what's the, is there this kind of nonlinear effect of disagreement on people's perceptions of the quality of the process um, that went on at each of these events. So we asked in the post test in the, tree, in the survey that, w that went out to them after they finished the meeting, we asked them a series of eight items that are sort of like this. People at this meeting listen to one another respectfully and cour courteously. Other participants seem to hear and understand their views. And there were six other items that were like this that were kind of tapping the normative merits of the process itself. We also had a set of four items asking people about sort of the quality or le even legitimacy of the policy that was decided on uh, at each of these events. And so each of the events, at the end of the day, they had to vote on what they thought the best policy would be uh, along a series of dimensions. And uh, so there were these, uh, so the post-test asked these items like, I personally agree with the voting results at the conclusion of today's meeting. Decision makers should incorporate the conclusions of this town hall meeting into California's healthcare policy. And there were two other items. So we had a set of items measuring their perceptions of the quality of the process and a set of items measuring their perceptions of the quality of the policy. Uh, this model looks complicated, but it's not at all. It's, this is, so everything from sort of here over is what I've already showed you on a previous slide. And uh, here, we're in these bubbles here, this process quality bubble and the policy quality bubble, we're just simply making a scale of their perceptions of the quality of the process and the quality of the policy. So those are like the dependent variables in the model. And you can see what's happening is we're just entering the disagreement variable and the square of the disagreement variable as first and second order terms into these regressions. Um, so, you, uh, so you could think about, you know, when you're doing a, a, a regression and you're trying to capture whether there's that nonlinear or concave uh, shape to the response function, we could take, like, the, say, the, the process quality outcome variable here. Uh, do they think the process overall is good or bad? And you can see that we're saying uh, that might be a function of the level of disagreement, but also the square of disagreement. And so that's, we're, we're able to make an inference about whether their perceptions of the process quality is this nonlinear, in, in our, what we expect to be a concave function of disagreement. And same with policy quality. So that's what this model does, is it's testing for this nonlinear effect. Uh, and indeed, we find it to be true uh, that, in fact, it's just what you'd expect to see so when there's a lot of agreement, uh, people are somewhat satisfied with the process, when everybody totally agrees with each other at a table. And then when there's moderate disagreement, people like the process even more. Right, that's process, yeah. 
But then if, if people are totally disagreeing with each other, if they're at the high end of disagreement by our measure, then they don't like the process at all. And even sort of even the, the end points make sense where you know, people, if they agree with each other, they're kind of moderately satisfied. If they totally disagree with each other, they're completely unsatisfied. But it's this, you know, what's most interesting for us is that there's this kind of non-monotonic effect where the robustness of the exchange of ideas uh, is maximized at this moderate level of disagreement. And that's true for both perceptions of the quality of the process as well as perceptions of the quality of the policy. Uh, uh, the other dimension I mentioned is whether there's uh, persuasion going on at these events. And so persuasion would be, you know, at the table, if everybody, you know, it, the way we're going to talk about persuasion is a model that tests whether if everybody at your table changes their mind in a, in a given direction, so they all become more liberal, do you also become more liberal? Or if everybody becomes more conservative, do you also become more conservative just on these, these items that I'm going to talk about? Not, not as a person, but just your views on the, the policy choice that they were talking about. Um, and then likewise, if nobody changes their mind, do you not change your mind? So if that went on, that's what we're going to describe, that's what we're going to call uh, persuasion for purposes of this exercise. And so we were looking whether that was that kind of persuasion went on for these five items, uh, I won't, there's no reason to go over all of them, but these are your just kind of standard healthcare sorts of uh, uh, policy items. So should we expand coverage by working with employers to cover more working uh, people and families? Uh, here we have Californians should receive a healthcare voucher or tax credit to be used to purchase uh, their own coverage. Limit government's role to providing coverage for low income unemployed. So these are kind of ways to improve healthcare financing California, and there were five, these five items. Uh, and so what we do is we make use of what's called a conditional autoregressive model, which is, does exactly what I said. It picks up on if other people at your table are shifting their views, uh, do you also shift your views? Uh, I meant to, I'm sorry, I meant to label this arrow right here with what's called a row. And what the row parameter does in this model is it captures whether there's that table level dependence. Uh, and so what we're doing in this model is just the straight, is su does such persuasion go on at all at these tables without even worrying just yet about disagreement? And so we ran the model for all five items and we found that the row parameter was actually quite large and significant across all five items. So there's a lot of dependence at each table. So again, if everybody became more liberal, you were more likely as well. If everybody stayed exactly the same, you were more likely as well. We then reran the model, now taking account uh, the level of disagreement and sort of seeing whether that amount of persuasion varied as a function of the, um, of the level of disagreement. And we found, again, across all five items, um, it's actually kind of stunning. It's kind of crazy how well this whole thing worked. Um, uh, I didn't have anything to do with the design of the study. It, they, these guys called me in because I'm interested in statistical methods. And I ran the stuff, and it's pretty, Amazing, this is pretty cool. So uh, we found that there was this kind of non-monotonic level of uh, amount of persuasion across all, all five items. Uh, again, I, I should have said it before that the, the blue lines are, sort of give you a sense of a, a confidence interval around the, the, the conditional point estimate there. So that's the end of, of my talk. Uh, and the, just the substantive findings we think are themselves interesting because the literature on deliberative democracy cares very much about this question about sort of does disagreement matter and how does disagreement, you know, in democracy, disagreement's inevitable. And what deliberative theorists will tell you is that to some extent, it's, it's disagreement is good and you want that because if people don't disagree and talk things through, then they're just going to stick with their predispositions and you won't really have a very good, normatively good democracy and normatively good democratic outcomes if you don't have disagreement of some sort. Um, but it's interesting that you can have too much of a, of a good thing. Um, this also, I think, extent, I mean, I don't do the social psychology stuff, but I think that, it, that this also would help, this would help to extend that literature on uh, uh, mixed versus homogenous groups, because I think the psychologists are interested in Sort of, if you have people, if people have different frames, do they share those frames? The things where people don't really have strong commitments to their predispositions, but in politics that happens all the time. And so I think it's interesting and might extend that literature as well. Uh, but then the paper, you know, there, there's really not a lot 
a lot of what's going on in this paper is methodological. And what we're trying to do here is to sort of give a template or a framework, a set of methodological 